want us to uh, pray together. We're going to uh, use this prayer that we used last week uh, and uh, pray for Ukraine. And we're going to uh, just concentrate upon that situation for a while. Will you uh, all stand, please? And can we just spend time in silence? And in this silence... Let us pray for those who have lost their lives already. Ukrainians and Russian soldiers and others too who just happened to be in Ukraine at the wrong time. Let us pray for all who have lost their lives in these last 11 days. So let us pray for the crisis in Ukraine as the words are on the screen. Father God, King of all nations, we cry out to you now for the people of Ukraine. We ask you to rescue those who are vulnerable from the hands of their enemies, that they may live without fear before you all their days. Kyrie eleison. Lord, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord of Lords and Prince of Peace, our politicians are predicting the biggest war in Europe since 1945. And we simply cry out to you urgently to write another story in our time. Thwart the dark machinations of evil men. Give wisdom beyond human wisdom to peacemakers seeking an equitable and less violent way. May politicians exercise the wisdom from above, which is peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, and full of mercy. Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Holy Spirit, we pray for the church in Ukraine, a nation in which 70% of the population call themselves Christian. Give our many brothers and sisters in that nation courage in this crisis, that they may proclaim the good news of your kingdom, bind up broken hearts, and bring comfort to all who mourn. Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. You, O Lord, make wars cease to the ends of the earth. You break bows and shatter spears. You burn shields with fire. And so we ask you now to save the lives of many people in Ukraine. Make a peace that is strong and not weak. De-escalate the crisis. We hear of wars and rumours of wars, but you, Lord, are our rock, our fortress and our deliverer. Our hope is in you. And so we address the nations now in the name of Jesus. And we say, be still and know God. He is exalted among the nations. He will be exalted in the earth. Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Amen. Lord, we pray for that humanitarian corridor that's been talked about, that seemed to be open yesterday and then was suddenly closed again. Lord, we pray that in the name of Jesus, you will create again an open corridor where men and women and children 
can walk through and be safe. And we pray, Lord, against Putin's power, where he is speaking lies and falsehood. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that the Russian people will be able to hear the truth, that somehow they will get the reality of what is going on. Take away Putin's power, Lord, we ask you, and grant peace. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, who taught us to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Please sit down. Just had a news flash, uh, flash up on my phone um, that more than one and a half million people have fled Ukraine uh, in what is the fastest growing refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. It's the latest uh, news that's come through. We, um, I want to just address for a moment um, the desire that uh, has been expressed about how we respond uh, as a church to this refugee crisis. Uh, I know some of you will be wanting to give financially um, and uh, we, are, um, we have a leaders meeting tomorrow evening and uh, amongst other things we'll be just talking about the practicalities of uh, how we can respond and what it is that we need to do. We will be, um, uh, I'll issue on Tuesday morning um, uh, the results of that discussion. Um, of course, if you want to give financially today, you are very welcome to do so. Please put it in an envelope and mark it to, for Ukraine um, and we'll uh, make sure that it gets uh, to the right place. But um, there is a lot that we can do apart from giving financially, and that is also uh, giving in kind. And uh, we may have um, uh, linen cupboards that are overflowing. We may have other clothes that we don't need. Uh, it may be that um, we need to perhaps have a look and see if there's anything we can do. Please, can you be considering this, and will you pray for us tomorrow night that we get this right? as to how we can best respond. There are so many different ways at the moment and we uh, need to, uh, there's some local groups uh, going out from here. Um, we'll, uh, as I say, we'll make sure that uh, news is um, passed uh, across to everybody uh, on Tuesday and um, we'll respond uh, from there. But... Um, <clears throat> It's not easy times, is it? I honestly, uh, we are, um, I think it's true to say, struggling in our family about it all. Um, and uh, I'm sure you are as well. Because we don't know where it's going to go. We don't know what is going to be happening tomorrow. We don't know what Putin's going to do. It's all very well, everybody um, turning off the tap of economy on him, but he seems to be thick-skinned about all that. So, we need to pray very, very much. Not just today, but every day. We need to be praying for um, all our MPs, uh, especially tomorrow as that uh, significant uh, debate in Parliament happens. Um, we need to be uh, thinking practically and we need to be uh, 
just, I don't know, sometimes just sitting quietly, not having any words to say, but just sitting quietly and being in God's presence and receiving his power and his strength at that moment and his wisdom. Perhaps these are days when we will cry out to him like we've never done before. So I'll leave that with you and uh, ask you to respond. More news in the next few days uh, as to how we might respond further. And in Ephesians 2, where we're going to be looking this morning, um, bits of Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 3, um, particularly as we get back, as we get into our studies uh, on uh, loving your church. Um, this study book, I hope you've got yourself a copy. Please, uh, if you haven't, have a word with the stewards this morning um, and they'll uh, make sure you get one. They're £5.50. Um, it's a good read. Um, this, uh, it's easy reading, um, thought-provoking um, and well worth um, getting into. And if you haven't got yourself into a cluster yet, um, either a, a prayer cluster or a, um, a study cluster, then please do twos, threes, fours. Get Find somebody else to uh, help you um, uh, just talk these things through. If you need any help in knowing, wanting to find out who's not in one, um, then uh, please uh, get in touch with uh, care at Hilly Park. Dot org dot uk and we'll uh, point you in the right direction. Um, most of the connect groups, I think, are probably about full, really, um, at the moment. So here's a chance to start a new connect group um, and uh, a group of you uh, joining together. So uh, let's um, uh, let's get into this study and let's uh, use it to to build our lives and bring us closer. To Christ, It's interesting, isn't it, that Paul says in Ephesians 2.14, He himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and its regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. What powerful words in the context of today, in the context of a, a war that has been declared uh, in Europe and uh, a war that, yes, at the moment we can't see a way through uh, stopping, but yet here is Paul talking about Jesus and talking about how he wants his people to be one. He brings together the peoples of the world and makes them one, brings them in unity together. This is about unity. And that's what belonging to the local church is about. It's about following Christ. It's belonging to the body of Christ. And he's living together as one people in the power of his name. Verse 19, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And you are members of his household. That's what Russia needs to hear. That's what Putin needs to hear. These are powerful words that you, you want to pray into the youth, that whole situation. If you're wondering how to pray for Ukraine, then pray this in the context of Ukraine. Because in him, verse 21, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. We're not going to read any more. I think that's probably sufficient for now. But if you're going to talk about belonging to each other, if you're going to talk about belonging to the local church. If you're going to talk about belonging to the body of Christ, we've got to understand uh, what it really means. And it means 
that God has created each of us to join him in the work that he does. And if we will come together with him, then we will be able to do far and above anything we ever ask or think, really. There's an independent uh, individualism in society today. It created many spiritual orphans, uh, orphans who move from one church to another and never really identify, never really come under the accountability of a local church, never really commit themselves to a local assembly. These studies in Love Your Church teach us why it is important that all of us who believe in Christ need to be committed and active in our local fellowship. Because in that local church, the family identifies itself as genuine believers. We come together as a group of people who believe in Jesus, claim to follow Christ, and are desiring others to find him as well. And because of that, we have a common unity and a common love that binds us together, that is the mesh, if you like, that holds us together, and the love that we share together proves to the world that we're his disciples. So as we come together in love as a church family from different backgrounds and race and social status, we witness to the world. And as John Wesley uh, said, they will know we are Christians by our love. No one believer is the body of Christ on his own. I used to have a friend, uh, sadly he's uh, gone to glory now, but uh, in his early days of struggling to uh, get to grips with church and committing himself to Christ, he used to talk about the fact, I don't need church, I can go and sit in a field and I can pray on my own. There was a guy called, back in the early church years, um, he, he was called Simon Stellates, and uh, he built himself a pole and stuck it in the wilderness. And he sat on that pole because he believed that he was, he was able to worship God better that way. load of rubbish, really. Because you can't worship God on your own forever. You might get away with it on a day retreat. You might get away with it on a few days retreat. But ultimately, you need the companionship and the friendship and the love and the support of another brother and sister in Christ. And that's why clusters are so important. That's why if you're not in a cluster in the church, you get yourself into one. If you're not in a connect group, create a new one. Get into the habit of meeting together and belonging together because you can't identify yourself as a genuine believer on your own. When we come together in love as a church family from different backgrounds, from different races and different social status, we witness to the world the power of of God's spirit at work. Belonging to a church family moves us out of self-centered isolation. Here in the church is the classroom for learning how to get along in God's family. It's the laboratory for practicing unselfish, sympathetic love. Now our Sam uh, is, uh, was playing the mad professor yesterday and he phoned us up and he said, uh, will you, uh, Grandma and Grandad, will you come round and watch me do an experiment in the garden? And he had to do this scientific experiment to, uh, for school, uh, but he had to do it at home. And uh, he got all the kits and he, was, uh, he put it all together and he did the experiment and we took the photographs and we said, well done, Sam, and all that sort of stuff. It was lovely, really. Uh, took me back years. But it... it the local church is all about that. The local church is a laboratory where we try things out and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, okay, we don't worry about that. We find something else that might work and we work with that. You know, the biggest problem to growth in the local church is the unwillingness to take a risk 
about what could be done and what might be done. We delight in doing things because they've always been done that way. I don't believe those days live exist anymore, really, because we can't we can't live like that. We've got to f- have those experiments. Yes, there will be those ideas and those practices that have passed the test of time, and yes, you won't want to lose those, but there's those new things as well. The church is a laboratory where we learn together to care about each other, to share our faith with each other in ways that help us to experience Christ. Because, you see, we're made for relationships. That laboratory of church gives us the opportunity to love each other. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, if one part of that body suffers, then everybody else does as well. It's only when we're in regular contact with ordinary, imperfect believers that we can learn real fellowship and experience the New Testament truth of being connected and dependent on each other. That's what biblical fellowship is about. Being committed to each other just as Christ is committed to us. Giving our lives to each other. We all know John 3.16. I hope you do anyway. But how many of us are aware of 1 John 3.16? Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. That's the kind of sacrificial love that God expects us to show each other. A willingness to love in that same way that Jesus loves us. And if you're in the church family, then you will develop spiritual muscle. We don't just grow in maturity by attending worship services and being a passive spectator. It's only when we participate fully in the life of the local church that we build our spiritual muscle. The Bible says, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. Over 50 times in the New Testament, there is the phrase, one another, or each other. We're commanded to love each other, to pray for each other, to encourage each other, to admonish each other, to greet each other, to serve each other, to teach each other, to accept each other, to honour each other, to bear each other's burdens. There's a year's worth of sermons in the one another's in Scripture. That's what biblical membership is about. That's what the family responsibilities are that we are to put into into effect because God expects every believer to fulfill their faith through the local fellowship. The body of Christ needs every single one of us. and God has a unique role for every one of us to play in his family. That's called your ministry, by the way. God has gifted you for that particular assignment that he wants you to do. The spiritual gift that he's given to you, as you discover what it is, you give it to Christ and you put it at the service of the entire church. The local fellowship is that place which is designed for God's children to discover, to develop and to use their gifts. And with a wider ministry, We understand where the responsibilities lie. Our responsibilities are to the local church. That's where we put into practice the gifts that he has given to us. And the church family helps us to stay focused on doing what is right. None of us are immune to temptation. Given the right situation, you and I are capable of any sin. God knows knows all about this, doesn't he? So he's given us as individuals the responsibility of keeping each other on track. So we come alongside each other 
And as the writer to Hebrews says, we encourage one another daily so that none of us may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Belonging together in the church family allows us to be able to help each other through the day, through the week, through the month, to keep us on the straight and narrow, as it were. You see, Satan loves detached believers, those who are unplugged from the life of the body, isolated from God's family and unaccountable to the spiritual leadership of that church. Satan knows that such people are defenseless and powerless against his tactics. We need each other. We need to help each other. We need to come alongside each other and encourage each other daily so that we can spur each other on to good things. And as we commit ourselves to each other, we glorify Christ and show his love to the world. Joining the membership of a local church is the natural next step once we become a child of God. We become Christians by committing ourselves to Christ, but we become a church member by committing ourselves to a specific group of believers. The first decision brings salvation, and the second decision brings fellowship. And if we attend church because of a sense of obligation or habit, we've missed the whole point. Church is a place to come home to. And that's something to celebrate, isn't it? History tells us that in the early days of the church, it was life-threatening to be seen inside a church. I used to, when I was in college, I used to preach at a, a little uh, Baptist chapel uh, at Porton, just outside Salisbury, um, not far away from the Porton Down um, uh, camp, uh, German warfare camp and so on. That little chapel came into existence because of a group of people who escaped from the Bishop of Salisbury uh, and wanted to worship on, in freedom. And they, uh, back in the uh, 16th, late 16th, early 17th century, that little chapel was built by people uh, in the 1700s once it was allowed to be, you were allowed to worship in freedom. This country has not always enjoyed freedom of worship. The Bishop of Salisbury could have sent his henchmen to disrupt that worship service that was meeting in the forest at Porton, which happened to be just seven miles outside of the city if he wanted to. Because you see, it wasn't a free thing to do. But those people came together and belonged together. Those people had one mind, one purpose, one desire to worship together and to celebrate Jesus. And so they came together, they hid together, they worshiped together. A few years back at Spring Harvest, we were privileged to hear of a lady in North Korea who was in prison for her faith. And she said, as she was in prison, she prayed that she would find others who knew Christ as well. She wanted to belong. And she went to worship in the toilets because that was the only place that she could. And eventually, others began to identify themselves and came alongside her. And they realized just how much they belonged together. We belong to each other. When we come to Christ, 
We are his people. And so we worship, we focus on what is important, which is worshipping together. We grow stronger in our faith because we belong together. We help each other face life's problems as we live in fellowship together. We help each other go in the right direction and keep each other on track. We are a home to come home to where we can belong together and experience the reality of Christ. Belonging together is a most powerful thing as we celebrate Christ's love together. Let's celebrate being family together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.